All right, we got Terry. And uh, I can actually see and hear you. This, that, this is progress. We stick at this, we might get something going by this time tomorrow night. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Terry, you didn't hear it, but I did uh, an incredibly, uh, it was a, it was an, an incredible introduction, mate. I was telling them how about how you used to work in journalism. Uh, you've been working around property for 35 of years. You've written four books. Um, uh, you're one of the four um, uh, property market analyst companies that we deal with, but you're my favoured guy because you know, a lot of the guys, you know, they, oh, thanks for smiling, mate. You know that you are. Um, I mean, a lot of the ways that they look at their data and stuff like that will often tell you about what's happened, particularly the way that you look at sales volumes will tell us about what's going to happen in a market. So that's why I've always preferred um, your analysis and uh, predictions than, than anyone else. But so he's my number one go-to guy. And I was speaking with uh, Terry late last week and we were talking about the coronavirus and and uh, he very kindly offered to jump on a, uh, a webinar with uh, with our clients. Uh, this is a special client only workshop. Uh, and uh, and yeah, we can talk through the coronavirus and uh, and its impact and, and I guess what we expect from here. So welcome, Terry. Great to be here. I'm always happy to, to come on and talk about real estate. The trick is getting me to shut up, actually. <laughs> well, uh, how, I mean, why, why don't we do this? I think probably a good place to start. I mean, obviously, everyone's really keen to talk about the coronavirus and, and its impact now and I guess how the, what the impact will be in the short to medium term. Um, but I think it's probably a good idea. Many of the clients may not have met you before or, or seen your face. So maybe we should kind of do a little bit of a, a recap, maybe about the last 12 months and I guess what's been happening in, in Property Australia wide there. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what we were actually coming into is the second half of last year and um, coming into the start of this year, we had a situation evolving, which we hadn't seen in Australia for a very, very long time. And that was the figures for February showed that every uh, market jurisdiction in Australia actually was having price growth at one time. Now, that's a very unusual circumstance in Australia. The last time we had a genuine national property boom was back at the start of the century, 2001, two and three. At that time, uh, most of the major markets in Australia, right around the country, were all, all had great growth. Um, prior to that, it was the late 80s. So it's a very rare occurrence. So what we were coming into at the start of this year was a situation where all eight capital cities and all seven regional jurisdictions, regional Western Australia, regional New South Wales, all of them had price growth in February and in the, the quarter ending uh, the end of February. So. We actually started this year with incredibly strong markets uh, characterised by uh, quite strong demand, low listings, um, low vacancies. E even Perth had got to the point where vacancies were now well below 3% for the first time in many years, Darwin also. So we, we were just beautifully set up, in fact, for um, a growth market around the country in that rare circumstance of an, a national um I hate the word boom, but that, that's pretty much what we were looking like having for the first time since um, 2004. We were look, looking like having a national property boom. And, of course, the um, the new situation with the coronavirus is, is going to put the kibosh on all that, temporarily, I suspect. But um, it also means that coming into this really difficult period, we're, we're in a situation where real estate is really well set up to do what real estate usually does in times of economic crisis, which is to hang tough and be the, the safe haven that a lot of people retreat to because it's so solid and it's not volatile like share markets. And, uh, um, you know, rising sales activity, rising prices, low vacancies, low supply um, in terms of new dwellings, also listings for sale and also vacancies for, for rental. So a, a perfect storm for real estate to handle what's coming. So um, I think um, the good news in all this is that uh, because of what happened in the last six months, real estate is really well set up to deal with what's coming in the next, say, two or three months. Um, can't hear you, Tim. Sorry, I turned the audio off to prevent some of the echoing uh, yeah. there. Um, 
Um, so what about, I mean, a lot of our clients, uh, I mean, a lot of our clients are Perth based, obviously have their own homes in Perth, maybe investments in Perth or in Brisbane or in Melbourne. I mean, that's typically where we're recommending to kind of diversify our client strategies across those three capital cities. What about, I guess, how, how did those individual cities kind of perform over the last 12 months? I mean, I know Perth, obviously, we got growth in the last quarter. I know um, in the Perth market, I think going back about 12 months ago, we'd started to see growth in about, was it yeah. about 30 or 40% of suburbs in Perth? Yeah. Look, Perth is, um, has been unfortunate. You know, we all know that the Perth market's been down for a while. Well, Sydney and Melbourne were having their booms. Perth, for its own local reasons, and that's an important thing for investors to understand it, Real estate markets essentially arise out of local economic conditions. It's not about the national situation so much. So Perth has been down for a while. Early part of 2019, we started 2019, really clear signs that Perth was at last making its comeback. And then it ran into the, the Banking Royal Commission, the calling of a federal election, um, the fact that um, there's a lot of negative media because Sydney and Melbourne were starting to fall after their prolonged booms. And that all sort of put the kibosh temporarily on the Perth comeback. And then we got we got through the election and got all that out of the way and that, that fear that Labor with its unhelpful policies was going to win, that was put aside. A whole series of fortunate events happened, including the APRA changes and uh, the, the um, tax cuts, interest rate cuts, all of that. Um, so in the second half of uh, 2019, Perth started to get some momentum again. So coming into 2020, clearly Perth was coming back. Vacancies were down, rents were starting to rise again, sales activity picking up, and, and select markets were starting to see a return to price growth. So unfortunately, something else has happened to put a pause on the, the Perth recovery, which is, of course is the, the coronavirus and the economic crisis that it has precipitated. Yeah, I mean, Perth certainly has taken a bit of a beating over the past few years. I mean, I know that when we were looking at the stats, yeah, I mean, it was kind of, if you look at the growth, it was kind of just about to get break in a positive back at, I think it was around about 2017, and then APRA brought in their restrictions, um, yeah. trying to slow the Sydney markets on interest owner loans, investor loans, high uh, or low deposit loans. Um, yeah, and then, uh, but we've certainly, it's you know, after kind of dipping back off, it certainly seems that we've, we've, Gone back up. I mean, I know from infinite real estate uh, with our property management uh, here, I would say consistently, not necessarily every lease, but consistently, a lot of leases that we've renewed over probably the past six to 12 months, there's all been like rental increases, you know, around about yeah. 10 bucks or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah well, um, what we know to be true from, from history and from research is that um, one of the things that usually happens is vacancies get into a comfortable place and then rents start to rise in. Prices seem to go off the back of that. And we saw that in Sydney before it had its big boom starting around 2013, 2014. First, they had a couple of years of really strong rental growth, but not much with prices. So the fact that um, Perth vacancies were, were down to acceptable levels and rents were starting to rise again was a good sign that prices were going to actually do something for the first time in a long time. And we actually saw some examples of that. Um, so, um, Unfortunately, um, the pause button button will be we put again on Perth, but um, the underlying economy is much stronger than it was a few years ago. We're starting to see economic growth happening again. Um, always remembering that Perth has a very very good history of being a, a growth city, a growth economy, growth and population growth, and a very good track record of um, property price growth. You know, probably. The biggest single example of spectacular growth in a, in a city in Australia any time in the last 30 years, the, the most spectacular would be Perth um, in that um, that mining boom period, um, e even more than Sydney's done recently and Melbourne's done recently. That, that was really prolific and Perth does have a record of, of growth. And I guess it's it's easy for people to forget that when when it's in downturn and when when things are at down people tend to behave and think as if it's never going to get any better and that's the danger coming into this um, coronavirus situation that people will get into that mindset that it's never going we're, ne we're never going to get out of it and of course we will and i think we will relatively quickly but um it's always good to remember that perth has a great record of growth in all sorts of ways that it's got the credentials now for growth and that this period that we're coming into when a lot of people will be sitting on the fence 
afraid to take action, there's a really good time for investors to actually be thinking of doing something, um, to be one of the um, the rare people on the market because, you know, we know from um, the uh, success formulas of very uh, famous and very wealthy people is that you, you buy when others aren't and you sell when others are buying. You know, you do the opposite of what the herd is doing, basically. Um, so I think this is a, a time of opportunity around the country, but Perth is a great example of it. I was actually uh, listening to a, a share investing uh, podcast the other day, and uh, I think the the guy that uh, Peter Thornburn, I think his name was, was um, he used an analogy about you know when the herd start when the herd stampeding, you step to the side, let them pass, and then pick them off from behind. <laughs> well, yeah, um, that, that's a great analogy, and it's a, another version of, of of the same mantra, really. That. Um, yeah. What, what yeah, about I mean, Brisbane, South East Queensland, Melbourne, how those markets been going over the past 12 months? Well, Brisbane, a little bit similar to Perth. You know, a lot of people have been predicting big things for Brisbane. A lot of people have just assumed that because Sydney and Melbourne had boomed that Brisbane would follow suit, but Brisbane didn't have the credentials. They didn't have the drivers that caused Melbourne and Sydney to boom. But more recently, the ducks have started to fall into line. So we've got a situation where population data is again favouring Brisbane. Uh, the economy is stronger. The big thing that was missing for Brisbane was infrastructure spending. That's starting to crank up. And uh, the affordability equation comparing to the big cities was very favourable for Brisbane. Uh, the, the surveys, the very surveys conducted showed that when investors were asked, where are you thinking of buying next? You know, Brisbane often top the poll, so Perth recently has been polling pretty well as well. Yeah. So, and we were actually starting to see it reflected in the numbers. Every passing month when the core logic and SQM research uh, figures came out, the annual growth rate of Brisbane prices was gradually, or quite, quite steadily getting stronger. So mm. it was up to about 6% around about now in, in annual terms. I mean, month by month it was picking up. So it grew, definitely had Brisbane on a growth path sales activity was picking up. Um, so it's well set up as well and um, an opportunity also that it's finally getting on that growth path. And I might, I might just jump in there just because I know, um, and this is, I guess, more for the clients. Um, you know, for clients that have been to one-day intensives over the past five years, for clients that regularly watch my videos, um, you know, I mean, T Terry, obviously, he works, uh, you know, when we talk about the different levels of economic cycles, we talk kind of global, national and global, we talk about, you know, capital city and states, and then we talk about, you know, individual suburbs. And look, Terry, certainly, you know, he's the guy when it comes to the capital cities and states and the individual suburbs. But we have just also keep present that what I've talked to you about is those overall, uh, that global land cycle as well. And, and if you kind of break it down into those two um, expansion phases, the first expansion phase and the second expansion phase, what we typically see in that first expansion phase, and this is what the historical evidence shows us, is that those major capitals like uh, Melbourne and Sydney get the majority of their growth typically in that first part, that first phase of the cycle, whereas the supplementary cities like your Brisbane's and your Perth's are the, cap are the capital cities that typically get the majority of growth in the second part of the cycle. And you can kind of see that reflected in what Terry's talking about, um, you know, when we talk about those those kind of periods where Perth goes through a, you know, supreme period of of, very, of growth. And it's actually tied and linked very much to the, the commodity cycle being that Perth is so resourced uh, orientated. But, um, and look, I, I'd, I'd encourage the clients as well, as you, as you listen to Terry as well, and, you know, if you've watched the video where I explain the economic cycles, um, you know, see if you can fit or, you know, recognise where those, um, I guess what Terry's talking about is fitting into that overall cycle. Um, what about what about Melbourne, Terry? Well, I mean, Melbourne had a, a very a prolonged boom and then it had the, uh, the down phase, uh, 2018, 19. And then, uh, like Sydney, it started to come back very strongly in the latter part of last year. And we entered this year with Melbourne looking very strong again with an uplift in activity. And um, it's, 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 it's now on pause trying to adapt to the new situation. Um, but, you know, real estate should always be regarded from a, a long-term viewpoint. That mindset should always brought, be brought to every situation. And Melbourne, long-term, probably you'd have to say, the number one city in Australia. It, it's got just so much, it ticks so many boxes. It continues to be the number one 
grow city for population growth, both on the state and, and as a city. It gains from overseas migration and interstate migration, whereas Sydney actually loses interstate mm. migration, but it gains on overseas migration. Uh, so Melbourne's the number one uh, population growth city. The ComSec state of the state report, it's always a competition between Victoria and New South Wales, uh, but Victoria has, has take, overtaken New South Wales in the most recent couple of quarters in that report. So very strong economy, big spend on infrastructure, which is really important for real estate because that does generate a lot of economic activity, jobs, and therefore demand for real estate. And, um, you know, it's it's a more affordable city than Sydney. Um, it's a you know it's always in competition for Sydney as the as as whether or not which which is the most important city financially and economically. Um, it's it's such a serious contender. I, mean, I think at the moment the predictions are that it's going to overtake Sydney in about ten years as the population and, and, and its population. Yes, and it, it usually comes up better in Sydney when, in, in those sort of livability measures. So it's. You know, it's it's got all of that in its favour. So long term, it's, it's just a great place to own real estate. And um, you know, w one of the big trends I think that that's coming and was already underway is that the more and more people are choosing an apartment lifestyle. And, and Melbourne's really well set up um, to to be well positioned um, to exploit that fact. You know, overseas migrants who are comfortable with that lifestyle, young Australians who prefer the apartment lifestyle to a, a house on land in the suburbs mm. and downsizers. Downsizers probably the biggest single demographic event that's going to impact on on real estate from now onwards. Um, and you know a lot of that is um, older people transitioning out of the old family home into uh, a nice apartment, um, not downsizing in quality necessarily in living space, but getting rid of the green bits and the stairs. <laughs> and so Melbourne, Melbourne's really well positioned for that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think right. it's... All right. Well, how do you, um, I guess, let's get into it. Let's talk about the coronavirus and how you see it kind of unfolding and what, what kind of impacts you expect to see on uh, on the real estate market. Yeah. It's, you know, of, of all the things in impacting on real estate, this would be the hardest thing to predict because... This word that we're hearing used way too often in media the last few weeks, unprecedented, um, but it's true, unfortunately, uh, so very hard. But um, the best thing we, we can do for guidance of what's going to happen to real estate in this crisis, because essentially we, we, we have to look at it in real estate terms as an economic crisis. Um, what's happened in previous major national and global events and what we see, the trend is that, it's real estate that is the safe haven in times of economic crisis. We saw it in the late 80s when the share market melted down and real estate boomed. In the early 90s, the last time Australia had a recession, we still had um, growth in property prices, um, generally speaking, in Australia. In the early part of the century when we had the 9-11 event that was became a big economic event as well, around that time was a, a time of turmoil. Real estate in Australia actually had that, that last time we had a, a true national property boom. And then the global financial crisis, lots of people were saying in 2009, real estate's going to drop 40% in Australia. And there was huge media about that. But in 2009, real estate values on average rose 13.6%. Mm. And I think Perth grew 20%, I think it was. Yeah. In Every capital city in 2009 had double-digit growth in their medium prices except one and um, I can't remember which city it was, but seven out of the eight had double digit growth, and then again in 2010, there was solid growth again. So, every so time we've had that down to is it like just what you're talking about before, like this, you know? So, people, I mean, what I've talked about before is you know, with obviously with the volatility of the share market, a lot of those investors will often take their money out of that and put it into property, like what you've mentioned. Um, right. also, you know, property is a central commodity. I mean, okay, people might be you know losing jobs and all that kind of stuff, but. You know, people still need a place to place to live. That's that's one of the fundamental things. It's the lack of volatility with real estate. The fact that it doesn't lose ten percent in a day, and mm. just doesn't happen. It, it, sometimes it, it might lose ten percent in a year, um, mm. but um, it, it's a, a slow moving. 
cumbersome, dependable sort of a creature. And, mm. and that's, you know, people are looking for safety for their money in times like this. Um, you know, people's superannuation savings are, um, are suffering. The share market portfolios are looking pretty grim at the moment. Real estate look, starts to look really good. And, you know, we have that underlying fundamental demand for it. And one of the, the key things, you know, I, I mentioned earlier how, how strong real estate was coming into this crisis. One of the important things is that it is this uptick was not driven by investors. That previous one when Sydney and Melbourne boomed so much, that was... Um, had a big component of investors driving this time it's owner occupiers it's about the fundamental need for people to have a home and that's what's driving this uptick that happened in the latter part of last year and the early part of this year and that's important investors were largely on the sidelines and so it didn't have that um, element in it so it's it's even more solid than it might otherwise have been so you know, realistically, you would have to say that real estate's going to take some sort of a hit from this. It's interesting that the figures out today and yesterday for what happened to prices in March don't show any sign of that yet. Mm. It may be too early for us to see that. But Let me just give some context for that, sorry. So just so the clients understand what we're talking about. So um, CoreLogic, first day of the month, they always release their data yeah. um, for the month. Now, um, in the past, I mean, I just want to, also, just because I'm just trying to, I guess, educate the guys, uh, the clients as much as possible. In the past, I think we've talked about, like, you're not a huge fan of the stats that they release, right, uh, on the month. You, you think it's a bit of a rush and probably not yeah. that accurate? I, I think the um, at one point they were publishing, like, a daily index and a weekly index. And, yeah. uh, and media was giving it a lot of airplay. I mean, it was ridiculous because those short timeframes, they're so volatile. They're up one week, down the next. It's meaningless. Yeah. And yeah. even monthly has, has often been quite volatile and you need to look at it from a longer uh, time span. So it's – and it's that um, rush to get the statistic out on the first day of the month. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the prime motivation was to generate publicity rather than to inform people. So I've been just a little bit cynical about that. But um, nevertheless, that that's what we have to work with. Um, fortunately, there are also other sources, but it's interesting in the last – um, 24 hours we've had both SQM Research and CoreLogic release their latest figures and on for the month of March they actually come out identical they both have a 0.7% rise for the month for houses and 0.6% rise for apartments so the, the, the end result from both sources is exactly the same which is very unusual because they use different methodologies and they usually come up with big, different numbers well, so, I think note as well like because we had i think the first stock market crash was on feb 20 i'm pretty sure that was the day so you know that's 10 well not 10 days sorry it's only february right so it's only eight days before or seven days before um march started so you would have you would have thought that there would have been some impact in that data right well that's right and it's, yeah that's right um so what what that shows is that um like here we here we are six weeks after that first share market impact um, there's no sign of real estate following the, the lead of the share market. And that's one of the points we keep making to people. Real estate doesn't follow the lead of the share market. It quite often does the opposite. It's when the share market tanks to that degree, people seek out the safe haven of real estate. So um, real estate to date has held up. Um, it is relatively early days. Um, so we're probably going to see this time at the end of um the month that's just started, we're probably going to see some different numbers. Mm. But, Let me uh, add some of, my own, I'll add some of our own numbers to it as well, because I've just been I've been seeing a few emails. I mean, obviously, like you, mate, I get a lot of industry emails. I saw one of the emails from uh, the one of the investor platforms, Investorist, that were kind of reporting on their inquiries and sales. And um, what what they'd seen is they'd seen essentially in a, a, what they'd seen as a drop in buyer activity was the exact same as what they'd seen in seller activity as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, which I mean, that's how, I mean, I, you know, we, I'm not entirely sure, I guess, the, the, how it will, in the short term, how it will impact the property, you know, the results and the growth and, you know, what, how the stats that come out. But I think one of the things that's important to, to kind of um, explain is that while 
it will impact the real estate market. I think the majority of the impact we will see is on transactions, not so much on the actual house price growth. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, people are going to push buying decisions down the road. You know, someone who was going to stick their house up for sale, you know, obviously at the moment would go, oh, let's just wait for a moment. You know, people that are maybe looking to buy might sit there and go, look, just wait. So, you know, I think that's where we're really going to see a lot of the impact is coming from those transactions, not so much yeah. about I think that's, that's a very important point. Um, one of the reasons why we have prices rising pretty much everywhere um, in um, February, as I mentioned earlier, was because demand was pretty strong, but um, supply was very low. The, mm. you know, in terms of properties listed for sale was well down on the same time 12 months ago when markets were quite weak, which is rather strange, mm. but that's why it was. Um, so we're gonna see Fewer people buying, but we're also we're already seeing people withdrawing their properties from sale. People who, who don't like the situation, they don't like uncertainty. People who wanted to auction and now they can't have a conventional auction, so they're withdrawing their property from the market. So that's going to balance out. So there's still going to be demand, but there's not going to be much for sale. Therefore, that's going to help keep property prices up. The other big factor, of course, is what the federal government has just announced in its most oh, recent yeah. package. I mean, that's huge because it, um, the greatest risk to real estate values was, you know, massive unemployment long term. Um, my, my gut feel and my belief is that um, what's going to happen is going to be quite short term. It's not going to extend right through to the end of the year or anything like that. Um, but the, the, the big package announced um, to subsidise wages um, is, is a huge factor for, for real estate and, and for a whole heap of other things, mm -hmm. including the well-being of people. I mean, Bill Evans, of um, chief economist of Westpac, is probably one of the more negative forecasters in the country. I mean, he was talking about like 15% unemployment and getting a lot of publicity for it, but today he revised his forecast to 8 or 9% because of that package. Um, mm. that, that's a huge impact for the economy, it's a huge impact for real estate and it lessens the likelihood that this situation is going to see um, a big drop in real estate values. Yeah, I guess the other thing I probably want to mention as well, so here's what I've noticed. Um, I mean, I guess tying it very much to human emotion as well is that, uh, you know, I guess in the, the early days, I mean, I, I certainly noticed, I guess, when a lot of the panic started was very much after the, around the time of the share market, you know, people panic buying uh, toilet rolls and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and us personally, as a, as a business, like we noticed our inquiries certainly start to drop off. If I look at the last maybe two or three weeks, um, certainly going back about two weeks ago, like we basically our, our inquiry in a week pretty much died. You know, we we had some, but not very much. But then what I in particular noticed was after um, the uh, last week, as the, you know, we had, I guess, the PM start to give some slight, he was talking obviously about his restrictions, but there was a little bit of a mood change in his, in his, um, in his press conference talking about how the infection rates are starting to drop. Uh, there was some of that conversation and how I've, what I've kind of noticed is people are, I've noticed people's general sentiment is starting to getting better and better. And the inquiry that we've had through our website in the last week has been more than I've probably had in a couple of months, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I think I understand what you're saying. There has been a, a there's been a quantum shift in sentiment. And um, I've been having a lot of conversations in the last couple of days. Um, not, I've had a couple of conversations with yourself about this sort of thing, but also a lot of other people that we, we deal with regularly. And I'm pleasantly surprised and encouraged by the amount of positivity in there. And it's, it's basically people saying, um, we'd rather not be in this situation, but we, we're choosing to treat it as an opportunity. And I think opportunity is the key word for everybody in this, property investors, businesses, everyone. It's an opportunity. Um, on a personal level as well, um, pe people are becoming incredibly innovative and finding ways to interact with their family and friends without doing what they normally do, which is go to a cafe or a restaurant or go to the movies or whatever, or go around for a family dinner. Um, all sorts of wonderful, innovative things are happening. Um, lots of people I've been talking to have businesses and real estate are saying, look, um, this is an opportunity. Um, 
and I, I talked to you earlier about the, the analogy of surfing, which um, I think we, we both yeah, like yeah. that analogy yeah, where yeah. If, if you're going to catch the wave, you've got to start paddling before the wave reaches you. And so the idea of in this period when, when things are a bit wobbly is to um, get yourself set up to catch the wave when it happens rather than the, pe the people are freaking out and panicking and shutting things down and laying off staff. My big objective is to keep the team totally together and keep keep providing the same service, but um, use this time to get set up with new services, marketing programs, so that when the wave comes, and I don't think it's going to be that far off, um, we're, we're ready to ride that wave. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's the intelligent um, way to, to approach this. It's an opportunity. And it's the same for investors. There's going to be opportunities to buy well in Perth and in Brisbane and in other markets around Australia when everyone else is sort of sitting back because they're fearful. Um, the intelligence ones will be looking around the market, knowing that buyers will be able to negotiate from a position of some strength in mm. this climate and buy well and be set up for when that wave comes. And I think Australia's going to have a celebration like never before. It's going to be like peacetime at the end of World War II. There's yeah. going to be a celebration when we can go back to just doing the things we take for granted. There's going to be a big spend um, in cafes and restaurants and, and people are going to go into shops and buy things because, yeah, we're going to have a party. I just want to touch on that as well, like, because, I mean, there certainly is – um, that positivity I'm certainly noticing as well. Uh, I mean, as an example for the clients, um, you know, we, we obviously we, we lease a big building here in, in Leadable. Uh, last week I had the landlord uh, never once called me. I was doing the ages, but he called me personally. You know, he just wanted to check in, find out how things were going. And we, I had a bit of a chat with him and I was asking because he owns quite a lot of commercial property in Perth. Uh, and so I asked him about how his other leasees were going and and he, because he'd been basically doing the same, calling all his leasees, checking the impact, you know, what it means for yeah. them, for the business. And he was quite surprised by the same thing that, you know, there was quite a lot of positive sentiment out there. Um, I mean, I know personally for us, I mean, we've been, uh, you know, for almost 10 years, we've been running a lot of live events and, you know, I really love the live events because I get to meet people and I get to, yeah. you know, one on one with them and, and all that kind of stuff. But we have, you know, for a long time, I mean, there's, there's an expense, there's an inconvenience um, to going to, you know, I don't know, a hotel or a function room somewhere or something along those lines rather than just getting onto a webinar. So, um, you know, I mean, look, it's challenging, um, certainly not, uh, certainly present to the challenge uh, as a business owner, as someone who has, you know, 30 odd staff. Um, but, uh, and look, you know, I mean, there's obviously, sh you know, short term priorities that you got to focus on to keep, um, to keep things rolling. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's an opportunity to, to the make change. I mean, for me, it's like we can make changes that we've wanted to make, make for the past five years in this business. And we just haven't yeah. had time to do it because we've been so yeah. busy. And the thing is, you can't travel. You, you, I mean, normally you'd yeah. be getting around the country, you'd be flying to Melbourne. I'd be yeah. doing the same. Um, yeah. um, all your meetings are, are done via this medium rather than face to face. So you know, you don't have that travel time or cost. Mm. Um, so okay, mm. that, that frees up some time. What are you going to do with it? And um, yeah. Um, I think also just just for the clients as well to give a bit of context. So remember that we're talking about like where we're at night right now is the mid cycle slowdown. So you know. Overall, the economic cycle, think four-year recessionary period, seven-year fourth expansion phase, then finishing off with a mid-cycle slowdown. The mid-cycle slowdown, what you typically see is a large stock market correction. However, um, what you also see in that first expansion phase is very tight credit because we're coming out of, so we go through these huge booms, you know, everyone's over leveraged, overvalued, the, you know, the system has to correct itself at some point. We go into these giant recessionary periods. As we go through those recessionary periods, governments start making changes, you know, kind of slapping the banks on the wrist saying, you know, we're lending too much before. They tighten up all the lending. And, and then as we build through this first expansion phase, we get to the end of it. And we move into the cycle where we need a rebalancing because of the innovation um, in, in the stock market and, and speculation in the stock market. But because people are not over leveraged, like, I mean, I think the average LVR for a person with a mortgage is 50 something percent. So the average person ho ho owns half of their property. It yeah. means 
that homeowners, it means that investors have buffers and safety nets to yeah. survive the stock market crash, the mid-cycle slowdown. And then yeah. also what happens and what pushes us and leads us into this second expansion phase is then all the governments jump in because they're not, they're not over-leveraged either and they start throwing money at the market. Then what you also find to further compound it is because that first expansion phase with the stock market is primarily driven by innovation and speculation, this stock market crash is what is going to allow all the value investors to start getting into the market. The people that invest based on fundamentals rather than, hey, I'm going to invest in this new startup because it could be the next Facebook or the next Uber or, or whatever it is. So that's why there's so much money available to be thrown around at the moment because while you know, we, um, while things seem, you know, I guess uncertain and fearful at the moment, it's really our underlying strength. I mean, banks two years ago, were, was it two, three years ago, maybe a little bit more actually, were forced to hold much greater reserves than what they used to hold. Hence why they're a lot more secure now. And why, notice how all these, I mean, we have a problem, government just starts throwing money at it. Banks go, hey, people want three months off their home loans, no dramas. So yeah. this is, this is how it's kind of, you know, all coming together in this mid-cycle slowdown and setting us up for this last expansion phase. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, and it's a very common question, I bought 13 in five years, but people struggle to get their head around it. And they're like, you know, how could you have possibly have bought 13 in five years? And the main reason was because I started investing in the property market off the back of the dot-com bubble. When we had that dot-com stock market crash in 2001 through into 2002, that's when I, I got into invest. I bought my first house in 2002. It was that huge run after that allowed me to do it. And, and I think we have a similar kind of period coming coming ahead. What 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 do you um? I mean, give us a bit of a sense about what what you see. You know, let's let's say the coronavirus crisis is. You know, we can see the end of it, or we know it's over, or whatever it is. But what do you? How do you? I guess then see how markets move. I mean, can we can we look that far ahead when the when we clear that concern out of the way? How do you think the markets, Perth, Melbourne, Brisbane, will perform? Well, you know what what, what we have in place now is a certain set of fundamentals in, in each of those markets. Um, we, you know, we're, we're Perth poised for another growth phase. We have Brisbane um, coming into a growth phase. We have um, we have cities like Adelaide. We never get never gets talked about. Um, got, there's a lot happening there that people don't appreciate. Um, so once we get this out of the way and Australia starts to gradually get back to normal, um, those underlying fundamentals, you know, click in more and more. The, the fundamentals don't change. Um, the fundamentals of Melbourne that we just talked about are, are still going to be in place um, when we come out the other side of this um this coronavirus crisis. Well, obviously, we've got the population growth, right? Really strong economy. I yeah. mean, I think that was primarily the thing that saved it from the downturn as compared to Sydney was that population growth that it was going through as well. I mean, Perth, was our population starting to boom and we've had negative net migration for a number of years, but I, I think that's just come back. To, it's been trending up and I think it's now broken through in a positive or something close. Our mining investments is building up at... at, at I'm not sure how the coronavirus is going to impact that, but worst case, I might push down the road a bit, right? Well, you know, one of the things that's, that's got to happen is you know, China has sort of um, shut down to deal with that situation, and, and the news tends to suggest that they're starting to get back to some sort of normality. They feel they've got on top of it. Mm. You can never be totally certain of the news coming out of China, but that seems to be what the news bulletins are telling us. I think they're going to be investing big time to get, you know, to get their economy back to where it was. And that means that Western Australia as a state that provides a lot of the resources, the iron ore, for example, is going to um, have a very strong economic uplift from that. So I think that's going to be a big factor for the Perth property market and, you know, and China's Brisbane as well. Sorry Brisbane, about that? Brisbane's impacted a bit by mining as well, isn't it? Yeah, um, Brisbane's um, you know more more about coal and um, and other resources, so whereas Western Australia it's iron ore. But um, but there's all sorts of other re, um, minerals as well that, that that factor into it. Those are the big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I think um, China's going to become a, a very big customer um, as as it fights back, as as we know it will, because we we know that it's a very ambitious country. It's very ambitious to be the strongest. 
most powerful economic force on the planet. And um, I don't think it's going to, um, the, the coronavirus hasn't changed that ambition and they're going to be um, very, very ambitiously uh, and strenuously trying to get back to where they were. And that's that's going to be great for Western Australia. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Is um, What I might do now is this. I'll, I'll, I'll give Terry just a, I'll, I'll, I'll just set everyone up now. If you've, We're going to go into some questions soon. So if you've got some questions that you want to ask, um, type them up and stick them in the chat box. Um, while we wait for people to do that, Terry, um, uh, is there anything else that you want to cover about the, the coronavirus or the markets at the moment? Um, look, we've covered off on it pretty well, and we've talked about I mean, I think the, the figures out today. I think um, I, I was really interested in because it was the first first chance to get get some indication that um, of which way real real estate was going to lean because mm. you know, we've got competing forces. The the ones who say real estate's going to crash, um, and some those forces that want real estate to crash because they, they kind of resent real estate, There's those sorts of people are out there, um, and others that say, no, real estate's going to gonna be really solid. So this is the, the, the first real marker, and um, it's, it's, it's been very solid. We yeah. do recognise it's early days, but yeah. I would have expected that if this economic crisis was going to smash real estate the way some have predicted. We would have seen some indication of it in this month's figures because, as yeah. you pointed out, the, the share market started tanking you no know, six weeks ago. Um, real estate has not, um, you know, prices didn't just stay solid. They actually rose in, in March. Yeah. 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 Um, well, all right. We've uh, we've got some questions here. I'll uh, I'll throw them out to you, Terry. This first one I might answer. So look, uh, so Joanna asked a question about the government grant. So look, Joanna, just and to anyone else that's listening as well, I, I probably didn't handle this as as sensitively as I could have. Um, so I do apologise. Look, uh, in talking about where we're at in the mid cycle slowdown and what's coming, um, you know that's all. It's great news for homeowners and investors, providing you're not someone who's immediately impacted by, you know, things that are happening, providing you haven't lost your job, providing that you haven't been given, you know, hours haven't been reduced. Um, I mean, there certainly is going to be uh, an impact there. And look, Joanna, as a client, you know, the thing that I'd recommend that you do is you speak with your client manager, you reach out to us so that we can give you some maybe guidance or help, um, certainly with regards to your, to your investments uh, or your home. I mean, there's, you know, things that we're doing for clients all the time, like, um, you know, some of the positives I think that have come out of this. I mean, at the moment, there is a 2.88% interest only um uh, loan available for investors. That is the cheapest investment loan I have ever seen in my life. And it means that, you know, there's people that, okay, maybe you're doing it tough right now or things like that, but maybe we're able to refinance or get your bank to drop your interest rate so that, uh, I mean, that's a, that could be a huge saving. Um, obviously, there's also, uh, we can walk you through um, some of the other assistance that's available as well. Banks are um, certainly giving people um, hardship periods, three to six months. I know one of the most common questions that I've been getting from people is if I take advantage of these hardship periods, will it impact my credit rating? Um, yeah. Now, yeah, so from the banks that I've spoken to so far, the answer is no, it doesn't, okay? However, I don't know that that's the case for all the banks. So it's certainly the one of the things, if you're speaking to your bank about it, it's certainly something you want to inquire about. Um, but um, but we've found with a lot of the banks that we deal with here through Infinite Finance, they're, you know, they're, they're, they kind of have a quick question with you. Hey, have you been impacted? Yes, I have. What's happened? Great. How about we put your, your loan on pause for three months? Now, um, there was another question that I'll kind of address at the same time. Rick said, is there any benefit to putting our mortgage on hold for three months rather than paying out of our savings? I guess the thing, you know, some people might sit here and see a bit of an opportunity. Okay, save for three months. Don't pay my mortgage. I get the thought, but the thing that you've also got to keep in mind is that whatever interest you do not pay now is going to be capitalised on top of the loan. Okay, so what that means is that effectively you'll then lend that out over the full period of the loan, meaning that, I mean, you guys have been to evening workshops, you've been to one-day intensives, you know that when you take out a mortgage, you're going to end up paying, um, you know, two and a half times that back to the bank, right? So whatever you don't pay now, Rick, you're going to end up paying two and a half times back to the bank at the end. So my recommendation would be keep paying, if you can keep paying your mortgage without hardship, keep paying your mortgage. Um, 
Sorry, mate. I just want to answer those for the clients. Um, yeah, cool. It's got a question here. I'll throw this one uh, uh, over to you. And see what you think, mate. Um, he had he said, "Will the halt on evictions lead to tenants not paying their rent?" What do you think? Oh, look. Yeah, I mean, um, I understand that concern. I'm concerned as well because see, we don't have any detail on what they they just thrown it out there that they're going to have some sort of rule that tenants can't be evicted if they can't pay their rent and it, it appears at face value to be offer open slather to tenants that means well i just don't have to pay my rent and they can't evict me so they've got to be, they haven't given us the detail yet and i hope they're smart enough to realize that if they just put it out there like that they're going to create a really bad situation they're going to solve one problem and create another that's even bigger so i did I, see Actually, um, there was a media release that got put out today. I think it was from Real Estate Institute of Australia that was actually clarifying uh, the PM's comments. I must admit, I didn't get a chance to read it today because it's a bit flat out. But, um, but yeah, I think they were coming out with some kind of clarifications. Look, look, the, the, look I, I, you know, I don't have a huge amount of faith in, in politicians, but I think they're smart enough to see that if, that if they put it. If they put put out their policy as it's been reported in the media, it's going to create a, a real problem. Um, and it, I don't think it's necessary. I, you know, there's, there's been a bit of an image created that um, you know people are just um, can't pay their rent and they're losing their tenancy. Yeah, there's a certain amount of amount of that, but I don't think it's as widespread as has been indicated. I mean, you've probably done the same thing, Tim. I've, I've phoned all my property managers and I said, I want I want to check on how my tenants are. And you know. If any of them have a problem, they've lost their job or had their hours cut back, I want you to let me know so we can work something out for them. But so far, they're all okay. Um, nobody, yeah. nobody. Yeah, we've been speaking to our tenants, obviously, uh, um, Infinite Real Estate's been speaking to our tenants and checking in with people. Um, we kind of had the same. There, there has been some people that have been impacted and, you know, we... One of the good things is it's it's also it can be pretty easy and clear to find out where you can get support as well. So we're able to assist those that are uh, having difficulties, but the majority are fine. And I think Ben, the other thing, just to kind of wrap up that question, there is, look, if if you are worried about you know you're a property investor and you've got a uh, you're worried about whether your tenant's going to keep paying rent, um, there is that I guess that that safety net of understanding that well, look, even if the tenant does stop paying rent. Um, the bank will probably work with you um, to help you through with your repayments. Yeah. And so, you, you know, it's not just tenants not paying rent, you're going to be in a tough spot. Um, there's there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of support there before you're in trouble. And that, that, that federal package announced earlier this week, the, the big one, the wage subsidy one, that, that um, overcomes a lot of the problems that might otherwise arise. Won't over overcome all of them because... It's impossible to frame that sort of policy to cover every contingency, but it goes a long way to removing our concerns about unemployment, people being unable to pay the mortgage or the rent. Um, yeah. So yeah. that was a game changer. I mean, gobsmacking numbers. Yeah. I'm not going to use that word that media is using too much again, but, you know, we haven't, we haven't seen anything like that ever before. <laughs> What about for Linda? Linda's asking, so if we want to sell, do we do it now or wait until the pandemic is over? If you want to sell, I would say that if, unless you have to sell, you wouldn't want to be doing it in this climate. Um, generally speaking, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, there's there's a lot of generalisation in real estate. It, it, it's got to be taken on a market-by-market market basis. We don't have one market in Australia. We've got thousands of different markets. There may be markets where there's an opportunity as a seller because a lot of sellers are actually withdrawing their properties from the market because they they don't like the uncertainty or they they can't put it to auction as they plan to, so they're just withdrawing. And it may be that um, depends on where that property is and what sort of market it sits in. But um, you would my dad, my dad's been living in Queensland for the past twenty years uh, there with his uh, with his second wife, and um, he's been recently talking about maybe moving back to Perth. And he was actually last last week they they came back uh, they came back to Perth to meet my uh, my firstborn child had earlier in the year, and um, and they've now they've put an offer in on a place. So this is why all the Corona shutdowns were going on. They put an offer on a house down in because uh, they're moving down to Bunbury to be uh, near his brother, um, and they're sticking their house on the market. So you know, and he he kind of asked me about what I thought he should do, 
Um, I, I kind of had a similar p perspective. It's a bit hard to tell. Put it on the market, you know, see what happens. There might be motivated buyers out there, um, but, you know, you don't have to accept anything that doesn't give you what you want. And, uh, you know, worst case, we wait until this is over. And, and like you said, everyone's going to be out on the streets having a party when this is over. We're going to be you know, going on holidays and buying all the stuff that we haven't been buying. And, yeah. and, and, and we're, going to have, we're going to have crowds at sporting events like we haven't seen in a long time. You know, people are just going to go to stuff because they can, because right now they can't. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Really, it's, right. it's really frustrating. Excellent. Let's have a, have a look. What do you got? Oh, there's lots of questions here. Um, oh, so I've got a question from Cole. I might answer this one, but um, Cole uh, has got a couple of homes under construction, one in Kombucha, one in South Ripley, concerned about whether uh, the construction will be delayed um, and if he's going to be out of, po out of pocket, if there's going to be any construction delay. Um, look, I've got to be honest, Cole, I haven't actually touched base with this particular builder about um, the impact on them. Um, the reason being is that I haven't really seen any major impact on, on the builders. Um, you know, they're all still going to site. They're all still building homes. Um, yeah. There haven't been any restrictions. I haven't had it seen an impact. That anything for you there, Terry? Have you seen any impact on construction? Um, not yet. I've, I've seen a number of um, media releases in the last few days from Master Builders and Housing Industry Association to the effect that they want um, the industry to be declared like an essential industry, um, uh, you know, arguing that um, this is a great way to keep the economy going, to set us up for recovery. Um, no, construction is, is going to be one of the engines that drives the recovery and um, hoping that they don't get shut down so far that hasn't happened, and um, this, this doesn't appear to be a reason. Um, I don't know. It all comes down to the, you know this concern about you know um, how many people cluster together in one place and social distances, which is really important. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But to date, I think construction is happening as as normal as it could possibly can in the current circumstances. Sure. All right, so uh, this is a question that someone sent privately, so I won't say the name, but they were asking how banks are seeing refinance options at the moment rather than facing hardship periods or interest capitalisation. Is it difficult time to gain refinance? So I might just give you my perspective first and throw it over to, to, um, to Terry. Um, so refinancing, it, oh, it's a bit, bit hard to answer this question, a simple yes or no, or it's hard or it's simple. Um, there are some certainly some good things which Terry touched on at the beginning of the webinar that's happened over the past year. Things like we've seen um, uh, the lending restrictions from APRA be, be removed on interest only loans, on investor loans, and on low deposit loans. We've also seen, uh, and this was a major change, probably one of the biggest changes we've seen in finance was APRA also altered what they refer to as the assessment rate. So when a person is applying for a loan, they apply at the assessment rate, not at the current interest rate. So the assessment rate is all or used to be sat at least two and a half percent higher than the interest rate you're applying for to give you some buffer to allow for changes. They, uh, sorry, it wasn't two and a half percent, sorry, it was a seven and a half percent as a minimum. They've made a change now so that it actually moves more with um, the actual interest rates. And now it's only, it has to be a minimum of 2% above the rate that you're applying for. The overall impact that we've seen on this is it essentially has meant that people have been able to borrow about 20% more than what they used to. So in terms of the question asked, in some respect, it's easier to get finance now or to get a refinance than it was maybe 12 months ago. Um, if you're being impacted though, like if you've lost your job or you've lost hours, that will make it harder to do a refinance, in which case you won't look at doing a refinance and that's where you'd probably uh, speak to your bank about one of the hardship options. I have also heard about banks um, offering home loan variations. So rather than just, um, you know, putting your interest on the end of the loan, um, giving you three months of no payments, they I have heard of some banks being willing to maybe put you on a fixed rate or put you on an interest only rate. Um, however, I'm not fully aware of how the, each of the individual banks are doing that. So it'll just be um, dependent on the bank. But uh, for the person that asked that question, my recommendation would be uh, speak to your client manager. Um, if you don't know who that is, just reach out to us on one of our social media channels. We'll put you in contact with them and they can tell you exactly 
whether the refinance is going to be the best option for you um, or whether we look at another option. All right. Um, what have we got? Um, God. Lots of questions. Wendy, uh, what about this? Uh, I've got I've got a number of private ones here. So we've got um, a question from it was private, so I won't say the name just in case. But they're asking Terry, when do you think is the best time to purchase the next property? Um, uh, are we talking about you know in the in the current circumstances? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that's what. Yeah, yeah. Look, look. I think. I'll sound like a real estate agent, but I think now is is a is a really good time to be actually in the market looking for opportunities. Now I, I come back to my one of my earlier points. The most key word in this phase for all sorts of people, including investors, is opportunity. Um, I did a webinar last week where a couple of people were asking questions along the line: Should we sort of wait to see how uh, low the market falls and then jump in when it hits the bottom? I said, no, I don't think that's a smart strategy. That never works for people because nobody rings the bell when the market hits the bottom. How are you going to know it's at the bottom? Um, the data that will show the bottom by the time it comes through, it's been, it was six months ago. Um, so people who try to sort of time, you know, the bottom of a market in circumstances like this uh, never get it right because for those reasons. I think the, the circumstances are going to be that Buyers are going to be relatively scarce for a while. Um, start looking for opportunities. But the, the important thing is to buy in good locations. Um, you know, instead of trying to ab absolutely time the market absolutely perfectly, see the opportunity that currently exists. F do your research and pinpoint a location that's got the credentials for long-term growth, which is the most important thing, and, um, and negotiate well and get, get something at a good price. Um, that sets you up for the future rather than sort of, you know, is it the right time, hold off until it drops a bit or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say get busy now. Get busy now because the herd won't. The, the herd's going to be retreating and um, all the wisdom that's out there from people who have been really successful would tell you that now is a very good time to be busy as a potential yeah. investor. I think that's a really important point to make. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go and buy a house, you know, next week, right? But what it certainly does mean is this is the perfect opportunity to, you know, rev review your current strategy. I mean, you know, one of the things that we offer our clients, uh, at least once a year, we offer all of our clients an annual strategy review. Um, and this is one of the most valuable things our clients do because, you know, obviously many times it's, you know, a couple of years ago, a strategy was designed and it was put in place. Um, and then, you know, for most of the time, we just leave things on autopilot, but then we come back and we review our strategy. And, you know, firstly, we can see that our needs or our goals have changed. Or, I mean, one of the perfect, and this is probably one of the biggest examples that we see with our clients at the moment, is just by looking at your finance options. I mean, we've had clients save five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year just by reassessing their strategies and looking at their finances and how they're structured, particularly with a lot of the deals that are available right now. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, a lot of the banks were very stuck on int uh, principal and interest. Um, you know, interest rates were probably more along the lines of about 4%. You know, you can save a percent now and you can get on interest only, which is a, a big part for reducing your cash flow. Um, but then also assessing, you know, get the structure of your strategy, like how have we got things structured? Are they structured in a way where we've got the safety nets, where we've got the firewalls, where we've got the buffers that we need? Um, and start getting ready so that, you know, I mean, maybe it is you are someone who is, is it is it is appropriate to take advantage right now. But even if it's not appropriate for you to do something right now, you want to be ready to go. Like you want to have that, you know, you want to be paddling. The board wants to be paddling when you know this wave is coming. So yeah. you're, you're ready to take Yeah, It's a great, that, great analogy. We love that analogy. No, it's, a, it's a great analogy. Look, the, the other reason why, why it's a great time to be, to be busy, um, quite apart from the circumstances, is what you referred to earlier with the interest rates. And when an investor can get an interest rate that starts with a two, I mean, are we ever going to see circumstances like that again? Um, you know, twenty years from now, look back and say, "Wow, I wish I wish I'd done something." When you could borrow at two point eight percent as an investor, yeah. and and yeah. and you can lock it in um, 
on a fixed rate if, if, if you choose to and, and be secure with that. I mean, that, that's a hell of an opportunity. I mean, yeah. there are markets here in some of our cities, capital cities, you know, parts of Brisbane where you can, you can buy houses with um, five or six percent rental returns. Um, some of our better regional markets, you can do better than that. And when you're borrowing at less than three percent, well, I mean, that, that's a pretty good equation. And it's a very comfortable one for an investor to be in. So, yeah, opportunity again. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, I've got another question here as well. I know there's a few clients in this boat. Got property in Perth. Like uh, we got Tequin here, purchased a couple of properties for us. Uh, I know they've got an, a Perth property in Alcamos, which is currently worth about 20% less than what they paid for it. Assume a coroning gets sorted out this year, how long to see prices get back and above where they were in Perth in 2012? I mean, obviously, but. Bit, bit hard to kind of answer that definitively, but Terry, give it a go. Well, you know, what, what I, I saw from the latest, um, we, we do a quarterly survey of uh, sales activity and prices and um, for every town and suburb in the country. And um, we've just done the latest, latest one almost finished and, and areas like up in the north of Perth, like Elkin Moss and, and some of the other, um, suburbs of uh, the local government area of Wanneroo. But there, there was a big uplift in activity. That was one of the, the growth markets that emerged from that latest quarterly survey um, was, was that area. So activity was rising and we're starting to see that, um, particularly in the quarterly figures, not so much in the annual price figures, but the quarterly ones, we're starting to see prices react to that. So it was already underway. So the coronavirus thing puts a bit of a pause on that. I, I really don't think it's going to be the end of the year before we're back to normal. I think it's a, yeah, got to be a, a little bit wary about making big predictions. But uh, looking at all the evidence and you know the way that the curve appears to be flattening in Australia, um, yeah, I think um, it's not it's not going to be that long before we're starting to to see um, an easing off of, of where we're currently at. So I think. All might provide a bit of a distinction there as well because, and not that we've discussed this, but I'm sure you'll agree with me. Um, I think we're going to notice two different things. Like we're going to see like a, a light at the end of the tunnel with regards to the virus. And even though we still may be all working from home and still socially isolating and still, you know, not going to the park in groups of 10 people or whatever it is, uh, we may still be living a restricted life, but once we can see that the rate of infection has dropped and that we're now on the kind of downtrend, I personally, I think that's when the sentiment will start. You know, our lifestyle, we may still be working from home, but people are going to be piling into the stock market, going to start getting into the property market. Um, I, I think that's how things will shift. What do you th think about that, Terry? Yeah, and uh, also got to keep in mind, you know, what we're kind of, there's a like, Two or three different methods of dealing with this, and the, the method that Australia is using is you know, sort of shut down and, and, and prevent um, co people having contact, which could spread the virus. But it's not the only way of dealing with it. There's countries out there like um, uh, South Korea and Singapore have had a completely different approach. They haven't shut down their cafes and restaurants. There, you know, it's it's relatively business as usual. They've taken a different approach, and they've been successful in containing it, according to the reports. Um, and there, you know, um, China seems to be relaxing its restrictions and getting back to normal, um, sort of like three months after it, it kind of started. Um, yeah. So well, that starts to give us a bit of guidance because there's, there's been you know, plenty of criticism. Australia didn't do enough. It didn't act early enough. I actually think Australia's done quite well. And I think, I mean, you compare our numbers with, with those in Europe and Asia and also the, the US. increase is definitely falling off at the moment. It um, it got to four thousand very quickly, but it hasn't yet got to five thousand. It's just tapering off. So mm. I'm optimistic that um, it's going to be a matter of a couple of months, and we're going to start to feel confident mm. that we um, have got a future. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, just there have been a couple of questions about the share market, so I'll kind of handle that. And first and foremost, just please obviously be uh, mindful that this is only general. Um, we're not 
financial planners or advisors or stockbrokers or anything along those lines. So I cannot give investment advice when it comes to the share market. However, you know, if we look historically, if we look at the um, the global land cycle, this year is going to be a rocky year. Um, we don't expect to see the bottom of the share market probably until around about August, um, September, something along those lines, which is pretty normal for the share market as well. It likes to do stuff around about that time of the year. Um, we also typically see a, a, some more volatility in the beginning of next year as well. So, look, rocky year for shares. Um, I, you, you guys may have seen the email that I sent out um, for Christmas, telling everyone that we were expecting a stock market crash to change all your share market and uh, sorry share portfolios and your superannuation portfolios to December. I know a lot of you did that. Um, you know, one client uh, let us know that he, thanks to changing over, saved uh, over three hundred grand, which was just fantastic news. Uh, I know my own mother-in-law saved thirty thousand dollars, so that's good news as well. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, the share market. I know I'm not looking at, at the share market until probably around about the end of this year, maybe early next year, because I think it's just going to be pretty sideways, up and down, you know, just no real reliability. But um, but I will be looking at uh, getting um, some more money invested in shares early next year, whatever I can't get into properly, that's for sure. Um, but also, I got James, uh, sorry, I've got um, so a qu another question from a client here about um, uh, Jamie... Um, uh, if you've got investment properties that are vacant at the moment, um, let us know. Reach out to us. Have a chat with us. We'll walk you through all your different options so that you guys can feel confident about what's coming. Um, and then I did want to push, this, um, ask you this, uh, Terry, to get your feedback. So Jamie's asked, do I do you think inner city property markets will have more growth in the coming years, or do you feel the communities and suburbs uh, on the outskirts will have more growth? To be more specific, Perth and Brisbane. Look. I think, again, it's very generalised, um, but as a general statement, I think being close to CBD gets less and less important as we go along. I think what the, the, the thing that's most important to be close to is not the CBD as such, it, it's jobs nodes. And the CBD is a big jobs node, but it's not generally in most cities the biggest one. And um, what's important to be close to is infrastructure and jobs nodes. And, um, you know, um, in Brisbane, for example, the biggest jobs node is not the CBD. It's the what's known as the Australian Trade Coast area, which is, which is created around the airport and the seaport, which are quite close together. And it's a huge um, commercial industrial precinct around all those two big transport facilities. And that's the biggest jobs nodes in Brisbane. So being close to that's more important than being close to the, the CBD. So suburbs that have good infrastructure, that are affordable and have proximity to good jobs nodes. I mean, an, an area of Perth that always stands out for me is, is like that Joondalup precinct, that that um, Joondalup town centre with the, the infrastructure that's there is an extraordinary thing. Not many, not many cities in Australia have a Joondalup, and it's you know it's got university campus and it's got government offices, and it's got transport interchange, um, and a big retail. Beside a sort of a recreational area with a lake, I mean, it's you know, it's pretty much got it all. Being close mm -hmm. to that, I think, is more important because um, you know, cause, you know the, the suburbs around there are quite affordable. Um, mm -hmm. Some are pretty close to beaches. You know, that's all good real estate for me. More important than being an inner city suburb. There's a bit of a myth about that um, that you get the best growth in the so-called prime areas. Well, if you look at the long-term growth figures, that's um, yeah. very not the case it's not the case the the outer ring areas can 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 be market leaders on long-term price growth because yeah. they're affordable and the mass demand goes to um we might all aspire to live in peppermint grove or um those kind of suburbs but most people can't afford to um they mm -hmm. buy what they can afford to and if they can buy affordably in an area that's got good infrastructure and it's close to where they work that's where growth will happen and quite often yeah. it's it's, um, you know, a suburb, um, you know, in, in the city of Wanneroo up in the way up in the north. Some data that I love with respect to that is um, uh, I've got a data set that's from CoreLogic between, I think it was two, it's 13 years. So I think it's like 2001 to 2014. Um, and it records the different, um, uh, it breaks the market up into quarters. The bottom, like cheapest 
um, quarter of the market, the most expensive quarter of the market, you know, the second cheapest quarter of the market and the second most expensive quarter of the market, and it breaks down their growth over that period of time. And the thing that stands out is that the the, the bottom 25% of properties grows at almost twice what the top 25% of properties grew at. Yeah, doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and that sort of um, gels with plenty of research that I've seen and research that we've done because that's where the mass demand goes to, you know. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry, anything more you want to say about that? Um, no, no, that's fine. Um, well, I've got a question here about Secret Harbour. Are you familiar with Secret Harbour, like the Rockingham precinct? Yeah, yeah. Um, I certainly know where it is. And what they're sort of asking, does it have prospects? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. The property, I've got a couple of properties down in Secret Harbour as well, and they're just asking what the, what we expect for uh, for the future with with Secret Harbour. What do you see for Secret Harbour? Well, not specifically for that, for that off the top of my head, but for the Rockingham area, because we tend to look at areas in like local government areas, because yeah. it's very, it's very rare for one suburb to outperform the ones around it. It tends to happen in clusters. And uh, what, what stood out for me in our latest survey, our quarterly survey of sales activity, was that there had been some uplift, some noticeable uplift in activity in that Rockingham precinct, th those sort of suburbs like, like Rockingham, Secret Harbour. Um, um, Bull Devis, I think, is um, another one down there. Yeah, yeah there was... was there was quite a significant upturn, and when that happens, price growth normally happens. And Rockingham is sort of like, to a certain extent, it's like the southern equivalent of of the Joondalup. You know, it's it's the it's the designated precinct where where the government sort of invests in services and, and infrastructure. And you know, it's um, close to really big job sites. Now, again, we're talking to that figure of job sites that um, that sort of. Um, that big precinct where all the big industrial companies are, um, you know, um, well, I can't quite remember what it's called. But oh, yeah. Down at Rockingham Way, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, look, I think a little bit north of there, you know, where BHP and, you know, where. Oh, where um, oh God. Naval Base, like that herd, uh, herd, no, not herdsman, Henderson, Naval Base, uh, oh, giant oh, industrial. Oh, with all this. There's, there's, there's thousands and thousands of jobs there. So proximity to that, these suburbs are sort of close to the bay. They're affordable. Um, there's train links to the centre of the city. Um, you know, it's got ticks a lot of boxes, and we were starting to see uplift that we hadn't seen in quite a while in this latest survey. So mm. that, that's that's a good sign that um, those markets are on the way back. I think. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, just we'll do maybe one last question. So for anyone else that has a question there, I'll get uh, you guys to type it in the chat box. But while we're waiting on that last question, um, just something I wanted to extend to everyone. I've talked previously before about how, uh, you know, as clients of Infinite Wealth, like this is a client-only workshop, so uh, all we really should have uh, on here is clients. Um, so all of you being clients, uh, many of you, you may not have reviewed your strategy for a while, right? And maybe, maybe it's been six or 12 months or maybe it's been a couple of years. But one of the things that um, I, I think it would be a very, very smart thing to do at this particular point in time would be to uh, to review your current strategy. Um, I mean, when we review a strategy, one of the things that we do is we first we'll review, obviously, your needs, we'll review your goals, uh, we'll review your current circumstances as well, you know, how much you can pay yourself first, how much you can afford to be putting towards uh, an investment strategy. And then, of course, we're going to go through, review all your finance, review all your tax, like tax variations, how you've got that set up, review your cash flow structures, make sure that you're paying down your most expensive form of debt first and not paying off um, uh, investment debt or the cheap kind of debt first. Um, so what I've done is I've put an offer up on the screen there, guys. You should be able to see it. Um, if you click that link, all it'll take you through is to a calendar. All you need to do is just book a time where you think you're going to be available and then one of our, I'll, I'll pass that on to our client managers and get the client manager to get in contact with you and arrange a time, sit down, do a review. Um, look, they'll normally touch base over the phone, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and then what we can do is, uh, if necessary, arrange 
like a one-on-one -on -one online consultation rather than actually coming into the office and sitting down face to face. So, uh, so I've got that offer just sitting there. Um, feel free to you know click the link, go through and book a time to lock in your annual strategy review, um, and uh, and we'll just go back and see if there was any other questions there. Last question I've got for you. Uh, actually, you might you might be familiar with this suburb, mate. Um, it has been perform performing pretty well in Perth over the past twelve months. Mount Pleasant does that ring a bell at all? It does actually. Yeah, I mean, it's it keeps it's sort of Melville, uh, Melville local. Yeah, it keeps, Melville local. Keeps, there. keeps standing out as an area that actually has had some some pretty good growth in its median price. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm. Yeah, I mean, it's um. Just a good suburb, I think, in, in an area. That Melville local government area has got a lot of um a lot of credentials. Um yeah. and um it's, it's been one, probably the best performing suburb in recent years. In I think of your last Perth report, I think it was yeah, the bit the highest performing suburb in West in WA it was Mount Pleasant, yeah. I think. Uh, excluding the regionals, I don't, I don't know how the regionals have been going, but um but in Perth, say uh, metro area anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, it's obviously a good suburb and a good area, um, quite close to all sorts of good things. And um, so it's, it's been a performer at a time when you know um, many suburbs in Perth ha haven't shown growth. So if um, the quest person asking that question um, owns something there, well, good luck to them. I just like to re reinforce that your point about the strategy session. I think that's an incredibly important thing for people to do. Most investors don't even have a strategy. Most want to be investors. They just blunder into it. They they start the process by going online to realestate.com looking for stuff to buy. And in an, in my um, process, they've, they've missed out three prior five or six prior steps. You know, having, <laughs> having a strategy is really really important. Um, and um, if you've got an offer there for people to come in and re review their strategy. Um, I'd urge people to take that opportunity because if you've got a clear, coherent strategy and then a plan to implement it, you're, you're miles ahead of 90% of investors around Australia. So and it also just takes care of most of the decision making for you as well because once you put in like your needs and your goals, it will generally answer that. Like, you know, people might have a question about what type of property is better. But your plan will actually answer that for you, depending on you know how much money you've got to put towards an investment property every week, depending on when you're looking at retiring or what sort of retirement you want. A lot of the times, the plan determines that you don't even need to assess or weigh up which is the best. So, yeah, yeah. You know, look, so many part, part plan. So many people get overwhelmed by you know the, the number of choices, the size of the country. Where will I buy? They're overwhelmed because they haven't got a, a plan and a strategy. Once you do that, it narrows down the choices because um, it yeah. starts to eliminate options that just aren't part of the strategy that suits you and it becomes so much easier to make those choices. Yeah, excellent. Well, Terry, mate, lots of comments here in the chat box here about saying, you know, thanks a lot for uh, the way that you guys explained this and our knowledge. And, mate, thank you very much for making yourself available. I know, you know, it's 10 o'clock where you are right now. You're in Queensland. So um, thanks for staying up uh, a bit late and uh, and uh, speaking to our clients. And I hope everyone got uh, great value out of doing that. And, uh, you know, the offer's still up there. So please uh, secure your, your annual strategy review so that we can get we can start paddling before the wave gets here. Guys, thank you very much. Terry, yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Tim. Let's do it again. Um, I really enjoy yeah. these discussions. Happy yeah. to do it again if you, if you would find value in it. So yeah. I'd, I'd love to do something more regularly with our clients. I know we can have a chat about that and uh, and set something up. All right. Excellent, mate. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Please be safe. Look after each other and uh, keep an eye out for those who can't look after themselves. Um, we'll speak to you guys soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See ya.